Good morning, guys. Nice to have you here. Like I was uh, expecting a small, like super private bunch and now I just want to run away, to be honest with you. Uh, so a bit of a not very ordinary keynote, I would say, for a deaf uh, GS conference, right? But I can't wait, guys, to tell you everything about that super disturbance variable in our innovation process, the humans factor, yeah? Um, and the plan roughly, because it's not the usual keynote, I really hoped it's like a small bunch we want to we're going to sit together and kind of talk nicely. Uh, so guys, I've prepared a bit of a personal intro that I've actually haven't done in such a wide crowd yet, only to my students so far. So please, any like pickly details, don't let them go out of that room. I'm joking. Um, so allow me to take a little bit of time to really introduce myself because you wouldn't know me probably. I'm not usually in your areas uh, around. And then I want to make a quick distinction when we talk about innovation to make sure what we talk about and why it's not invention per se. And then, guys, I'm going to show you the human center design. So how we UX psychologists go about uncovering that human factor. Um, and I'm going to go in detail in the process on that theoretical level so you guys all get a grasp of how we go about figuring out that disturbance variable, um, but then I'm also, I've brought actually two examples from my actual work to show you, two case studies, in the hope to really make it tangible for you, as in like, what can you do as next steps, really. Sounds like a plan so far? You with me? You need more coffee? Good. All right, guys, so um, I wanted to, as I said, take a few minutes to uh, tell you where I'm coming from and the usual expectation here is like, I know we shouldn't be, like we should be excellent to each other, but that's my disclaimer, guys. I come from Bulgaria. It's not even Eastern European, it's Balkans, yeah? Um, and we are not like the British. We are not very good at keeping calm, like, we are polite, but um, just keep in mind. But that wasn't what I meant, that's kind of the superficial where I come from. Um, you guys will find me everywhere as Martina Mitz. See how human friendly I am? Good luck pronouncing or spelling that correctly. I know your brain is already asking you, how, how can we do it? Martina Ivanova Mitsieva Velia. Yeah? If you guys are in testing form fields, you're welcome. Breaks every form, yeah? Um, and why I make it a bit more personal today is, guys, because my story actually started over 20 years ago, not far away from here. I was about almost 19 when I arrived in uh, Frankfurt, and then I had to take the first biggest challenge in my life, learning German. To be precise, learning Hessisch, yeah? So I actually can, ich kann auch Deutsch sprechen, Leute, but it's much, much easier to present in English, so I hope you're all with me. Um, and yeah, I started kind of tackling that challenge, learning from morning till noon, uh, till noon, I would say, because I couldn't do it from dusk till dawn, learning Hesish all the time, yeah? So, and then my brother was also living in Frankfurt, and guess what, he had a computer. My computer, back then, there were no laptops. You guys remember, you had to like take your whole suitcase to bring your computer somewhere. But my brother had a computer. So that was not only my connection with back in Bulgaria, my family, my friends and all of that, but guess what, guys? I also started learning self-learning web design because, let's face it, at the end of the 90s, you were whether a DJ or a web designer. And I didn't have it that much with music, so I was like, okay, let me see. And then someone recognizes this software here? Anyone? Come on, louder, guys. I see some of you are my age. You gotta, <laughs> you gotta recognize these guys. My brother had installed Micromedia Flash and Dreamweaver. Guys, don't stone me. I've always used to say I'm cold allergic, but then Flash and Dreamweaver. This is how I started doing my own website and actually learning web design to have my own website. Guess what? It came alive 2010. It took me a few years, yeah? Um, but I came to Germany with the idea to actually study psychology. And in Frankfurt, great institute, but guess what? 
Frankfurt was like, yeah, you can study here, but you need to make a German exam that half of the Germans guys, you can't even make it. So of course I didn't make it, yeah? And then Berlin was like, you know what? English high school, what the hell is that? We don't even recognize your high school diploma. You need to do another year of school. And I was like, yes, Berlin, I'm coming. I was so looking forward to do another year of school, yeah? And of course, as everyone in Berlin, guys, I was super broke, right? And then guess what? I found a boyfriend, he moved in, and he had a computer. I didn't find him for the computer, guys. It shouldn't sound wrong here. But my boyfriend moved in with a computer, so I had a computer again. And I was like, yes, Flash Media, Dreamweaver, yes. But guys, I was 20, not even one at the time. I was 20, about to become 21. How do you go to businesses and say, here, I've got something for you, give me your money? I didn't know how to do it. I hope you're more clever than me. I was like, uh, hmm. So what I did, guys, is actually research companies, the, their physical addresses around my address in Berlin, check their websites, get some eye cancer and like, ah, research everything they're about, research who they're targeting, then sit down for like three, four, five hours. I will make a super quick like flash movie of a web page, like a super quick demo where just a button or two from the navigation will work. Then I would call all my boyfriend's colleagues, all neighbors, all random people on the street and just show it to them because I didn't have the confidence to go and sell. So I would just call random people that fit the target group and be like, here, react. And then watch them. And my, one of my first pro, uh, pro, projects was for a cosmetic studio. So I called all women that I knew and didn't knew, also neighbors, and I would just open that site and watch them. And they would be like, ah, hmm. That was my confidence, guys. I would get that and then contact the business owner and be like, listen, I've got something for you. And by the way, people say about it that they would like it, they can click. So that would give me the rationale to actually go and sell. Yeah. And that, guys, actually helped me partially. It wasn't like I couldn't just live from that, but it secured first small paid clients, the cosmetic studio next door, my dentist, yeah, some, a cabaret artist, so really small but paid projects. So half of the year that pretty much paid my rent. And it also helped me finance my study life in Germany. I finalized the study, not the life yet, obviously. I finalized the study in 2007, specializing as clinical psychologist. And guys, normal that in the, past, the last few years of my study, it was still diploma. Yeah, so I'm di diploma psychologin. Um, and in the past years, the last few years of that study, of course, I've completely neglected web design because I needed to write a whole book to finish that freaking study. And I needed to do like seven state exams, yeah? So I've completely neglected web design. It was like I need to finish my study, my profession. So... No surprise that it didn't even take me a year working as a clinical psychologist before I completely burned out, guys. I couldn't tell you one plus one. I had to go to a hospital even. And then that was the moment where it was clear, okay, I need to take a step back. What's happened in the past 10 years figuring out my life? How is it going to go the next 20, 30, 40 years? Yeah? And guess what, guys? It was so bad that my mom needed to remind me, hey, what about web design? You are so passionate about it. And I was like, right, there was something before psychology, my passion. Yeah? But guys, when I came back a few years later, well, guess what? All the web designers were coding. And I was like, <laughs> like, I tried PHP, this is where my coding life ended, yeah? Um, so it was all like web design started meaning really web development, and I was like, ooh, not really what I expected. But then I also started hearing about this user-centered design, user experience, concept development. So I actually started as concepcionarin, a concept... A concept <laughs> concept developer first, yeah? 
And then, guys, it still took me quite a few years until I came to actually marry my profession and my passion and really combine them. So for, what is it, four years now, I've been a consultant specializing in UX psychology. And I hope towards the end it makes sense for you why I've combined these two. Um, and, guys, there is not much difference. The same process I use to gain confidence and go sell to businesses, guess what, it's absolutely the same process I use now to give businesses confidence about the things they are developing. Okay? Bear with me till the end when I show you the case studies. I hope then it will really make sense. Now, guys, to wake you up a little bit, and I've actually uh, really wanted to make that distinction because we all often talk about innovation and people actually mean inventions. Yeah? So to wake you up a little bit, I've prepared a game for you. You up for a game? Need more coffee? Yeah, I've seen some nodding. Good. Um, and I want to warn you guys, it's a quite hard quiz that I prepared for you. So if someone gets a right answer before the last question I ask you, please come personally to me afterwards. I need to like bow in front of you, yeah? Just setting expectations here. Um, does anyone maybe recognize this guy? Anyone? No surprise, guys. I wouldn't have recognized him either. Uh, the guy's called Humphrey Davy, and guess what? 220 years ago, he was the first guy who light up a wire. Yeah, he visualized electricity for the first time that thing sparked, and it was like, oh my gosh! Everybody was mind blown in the room. Does anyone maybe recognize this guy? Nah? I also didn't, guys, before I did that presentation, of course. Warren De La Rue, I even hope I pronounced his name correctly. Guess what? 30-something years later, that guy enclosed that wire in some sort of a tube, so created the first vacuum, and guess what that did? It extended that lighting up of electricity with a few seconds. Amazing. Maybe you guys recognize this guy? Looks like a Russian, Russian scientist. Not at all a Russian scientist, as it turns out. Uh, Joseph Wilson Swan, who, just 10 years later, enclosed that same wire that was in a tube. He actually enclosed it in a glass bulb, and that created the better vacuum that he needed. So now it lighted up even 10 seconds or even 15 seconds. We could look at electricity now, yeah? Maybe this guy? Anyone? Oh, so I'm not gonna bow, because this was the pre-last question. The next one, I hope anyone guys recognizes him. This is kind of the saddest guy in the whole story. I'm really sad for him, because guess what, guys? A Canadian scientist who, in 1874, filed the first patent for a light bulb. Yeah? Together with his co-worker, two Canadian guys filed the first patent for a light bulb. And now I've already primed you, so I guess someone will... Anyone? Guys, really? Like, I expected from you to be like, oh yeah, of course, that guy. We talked to him before. Anyone? Okay, I won't torture you. That's the famous Thomas Edison. Did you? Why didn't you say before? <laughs> That's the famous Thomas Edison, guys. But, guess what? He filed the first patent for improvement of the light. And then, a year after he filed that patent, just four or five years after Henry Woodward filed his patent for the first electric light, this guy went and bought out the patent from broke Henry Woodward. And yet, guys, we not only associate the invention of the light bulb with Thomas Edison, more so, the light bulb has become a symbol for innovation, creativity. How come? Have you asked yourself? Like, there are five guys who've worked and invented before Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison hasn't done anything by himself like inventing it new. Just bought out the patent, and yet, we all know him as the inventor of the light. 
And that, guys, is because there is that huge differentiation between innovation, on the one hand, what we do, and invention. So all the inventors that none of us knew, yeah, me neither, before I researched that story for the talk, they all came up with like individual things. Guess what's the difference? The innovator is the person who not only came and connected the dots, but also looked at how does all of that actually fit the world, the market out there. That's the difference between invention on the one hand, just coming up with something new, and then seeing how does it work for the world, yeah? And long before we had these fancy graphics, Thomas Edison was quite aware of what's going out in the world. Um, and we do have this differentiation, you guys probably seen that graphic, the early market, like less than 15% early market, so your buddy inventors will use it, few of your hipster friends will use it, but that's it. Before you get all hipsters with the newest gadgets on board, it's actually a gap there, a huge gap. We in Berlin call it the Valley of Startup Debt because 95% of the companies end up here. They never make it to the mainstream market, yeah? And guess what, guys? Thomas Edison was very, very aware of that, even before our fancy graphics, yeah? Because he was about 18 when he was still an inventor, and he invented the electronic vote recorder, so a vote election recording machine, and that's where he's got his first big backlash political backlash, social backlash, like there just wasn't an interest to make fair elections at the time, yeah? So he's really, really got his trauma, he's really been in the valley of that, of startup that. Hence, what he came up with, guys, and that you'll be able, I've linked the paper and I'll send you the slides so you don't need to uh, like try and read everything here. It's a very interesting paper called Ideas First or Needs First, what would Edison say? And now hold on, it's from the grand great great grand niece from Thomas Edison. She's actually researched all archives and stuff and sh she has put that paper together geared towards innovation, yeah? And I want to read just that tiny passage for you guys. Please, like, even close your eyes and try to immerse yourself in what I'm saying here, what Edison was saying here. In the years that followed his setback from the electronic vote recorder, Edison immersed himself in a needs first approach to innovation, placing himself in the shoes of his targeted buyers. He literally went to their work or home locations and began analyzing the jobs they were trying to get done and how they struggled while doing this. Does it ring a bell slowly? We call that today, guys, human-centered design. Yeah? So he did it like hundred something years ago without even knowing the term. He actually exactly what I did because I lacked confidence. He did it because he's already had his trauma investing a lot of time into something that no one wants to use on the market for whatever reasons, yeah? And guys, you've probably heard user-centered design, user experience, design thinking, double diamond, we, we like to call it many words. It doesn't matter what you call it. At the end, the process is always pretty much the same. At the beginning, it's a huge mess, because we go out and we start discovering. We gather all the data we can get about the business, about the people, the targeted people, so there is a difference between users and customers, yeah, your kids are the users, you guys are the customers. So gather all that data, hence at the beginning it feels like, oh my gosh, that emoji with the, with the bursting brain. It's too much information, it's just madness. But then, once you get into that solution space, that design space, it starts getting a bit more clear, we might run a cycle or two to kind of improve what we are doing there, to find polish it, so that once that idea, that concept comes to you guys, it's pretty smooth and clear what has to be done for the thing to become alive, for people to use it and adopt it. And I promised you to show you the process in detail on the theoretical level before I showed you then the two, the two case studies that will make it really more tangible. 
So roughly, guys, I told you, I'm Balkanian, yeah? For us, it always starts with a problem. My Anglo-Saxon clients like to call it opportunity. You call it opportunity if you like, I call it a problem, yeah? It starts with a spark. A business comes to me and says, oh, Martina, it hurts here, help. Or, hmm, our clients are not doing that, what we want, help. So for me, it's always like, however you turn it, it turns out to be a problem, a spark, a trigger of a problem. Then, guys, my next step, as I said before, is to really go out, first understand the problem, the business, where is that coming from, but then also understand who are the people who experience the problem, who are the people observing the problem. Are there other actors in that problem space? So really to kind of grasp the entire problem space, if you wish. And because I showed you before, that's quite a messy process. I can't just go to my clients and be like, this is everything I've discovered. Work yourself through all the data. Yeah, it doesn't work like that. So I start consolidating all that knowledge that we gather, mostly also with the team. I don't just do it alone, with marketing research, with analytics. We put all this knowledge together, and now we need to make sense out of it in some sort, so that in the next step, we can gather all colleagues, all brains in solution mode and start looking for problem solutions. Uh, sorry, yeah, that's a discovery phase, and then we are good to go in kind of solution mode. Mm. And once we come up with many, many ideas, because now we know exactly what we are solving for whom, and now we can just let the brains go wild, come up with many ideas, build on each other, we come up with hundreds of post-its of ideas, and now we need to decide which ones are the ones that have the highest potential. Here I call it opportunity, yeah? So which are the ones with the best, the best opportunities? And how can we make them become real, but as cheap, as quick as possible? Yeah, so we prototype something. It's like sometimes, guys, it's just a paper prototype. It's just a sketch from an app. Sometimes it's enough to put it in front of people and just see how they react, yeah? And we do that because later on it becomes more expensive, right? So we want to know early on, super cheap and quick and dirty, so if it doesn't work, you just tear it and throw it the bin, you take the next idea. Yeah, so we try to be super cheap and quick here, so that we have something to put in front of people and start seeing how do they react, how do they interact with it. What are their expectations of how the thing will behave, yeah? And then, guys, once we've gathered that that was kind of the loop in that messy thing, then came a loop, and then it starts getting smoother, right? Because now through the test, we know what works, what doesn't. What have we forgotten? Maybe, because we can't always know it all, yeah? And then, what do we need to put onto visual design and you guys production, yeah, development? What needs to go really in the expensive hands-on work? What do we have the confidence about that it's worth it investing all the manpower and actually bringing it to life? And I told you, super simple actually, yeah, <laughs> to sum up in three steps. We go out, we discover, then we bring it together, we bring all our colleagues on board, now we are in the space to get in solution mode, and then at the end, when we have that confidence of what will work, what wouldn't, then we go on to the actual delivery of anything, product, concept, service, whatever. Um, and I guys specialize in that early step, because I've seen many companies have already become quite good in here, so probably also the companies you work with, there will be at least some quality testing, some user case scenarios that your QA goes through. Yeah, so that is kind of already quite well understood by companies that it's worth it to test quickly something cheap before we go on to the actual full-blown visual design and development, yeah? But I've seen that most of the companies struggle here at the beginning, that real deep understanding of humans and guess what? This is where I come into play, because, hey, psychologist, yeah? Um, so, I can't wait to actually, I couldn't wait to come to here, guys. I hope you too. Because I can't wait to show you from my work. It's like I live for my work. I'm dying for my work. So, I've brought you two case studies. 
The first one is about a behavioral change. And it happened in the um, beginning of March, end of February, beginning of March 2020. A client came to me from a small startup, five people startup, all developers, just this one guy, business developer. Yeah? And he comes to me and says, Martina, we know this human-centered, user-centered design. We have two types of users. They had an app for like rating professors on the university. And they were like, listen, our students, they work with us. It's all fine. The professors, they don't want to use us. We talked to them. They told us what to do, and yet they wouldn't use us. And I was like, ah, come to mama. <laughs> we need to do research, yeah? And I was like, OK, wonderful. Like, it's really I'm the right person for that to find out where is the, the fraction there? What happens there? Why do they say something? We do it, and still they wouldn't use it. So during lockdown, that business developer went on to talking all uh, to all his uh, professors and their friend professors. So we can actually schedule 12 interviews after the first two weeks of lockdown. Guys, I can't tell you what interview sessions these were. I've always scheduled one hour. After the second interview, I started scheduling hour and a half and then have another half an hour at the end because after two weeks of, of uh, corona lockdown, and you have to think globally. So I talked to a professor in China. I talked to a professor in Spain. Yeah, these were all guys who couldn't go out. It's not like us. They had to send an SMS to go to the pharmacy or the grocery store, yeah? So they were almost about to give me their PIN number for their credit cards. They were like, oh, no, don't get bothered by my kids. Tell me what you want to know from me. They were looking forward to speak to other humans than their kids. So these were great sessions. I can't tell you how valuable they were. But two out of these 12 professors that I managed to talk to in the two weeks, up to the end of March, pretty much, Two out of the professor were completely edge cases. They didn't even bother about feedback, and I did, they didn't fit our case at all. So I ended up, guys, analyzing 10 out of the 12 interviews. And that consolidation step, the next one, is what I used here is to consolidate them in an experience map. And that kind of was a bit of a hybrid between a customer journey map and a mental model diagram. I know I'm talking a bit Chinese to you here. Guys, don't get discouraged. If you want to know the methods of consolidating into experience map, I really highly recommend mapping experiences from Jim Kobach. The second edition is even better. And it's my favorite book because it's full of images. So he'll give you all these examples of different types of consolidations that help bring everyone on board. So in that case, I use, guys, a hybrid of a customer journey. That's the most famous one. You've also heard it in your companies with a bit of mental model diagram. And I'll show you what I mean. So all these 10, 12 interviews, you've got to imagine like two weeks, I've been talking every day to someone. Yeah. After these two weeks or 10 days, roughly, all these people melt into one. You can't say anymore who said what. Yeah, after 10 interviews, it's normal. And that's exactly what I'm looking forward to, actually, because after I finish the last interview, I sleep over. Very important. You've got to let your subconscious brain sort all the information. I sleep over, and then the next day I get up, and that melted person out of 10 people, that average person, I don't like to call them average, but that representative melted together person, I write down quickly their story, so the most common story between all these people. I write quickly down their attitudes and their goals, their jobs to be done, what they're trying to achieve in their day to day. And then, guys, that structure that you see on top, so you see here is a journey. Here are a bit of different mindsets. That's what I meant. So that will be the customer journey, and that's a bit of a hybrid with mental model. So I picked their brains as to how do you guys even perceive feedback to your work? Who do you ask when you put your lectures together? Yeah, I try to put them in different mindsets where they actually get feedback for their work and they take it serious. And you see on top, the gray and the black, this is the structure of my map that's already pre-given, guys, pretty much from the structure of the interview I'm leading. 
Yeah? So I just put this on top. And then you see the yellow post-it. So you see actually it's kind of four lanes here. We have actions, touch points, pain points, thoughts and feelings. Yeah? So I start after these 10 interviews, I know pretty much eight, nine people said that they're doing that in that stage. So I put the yellow post-its already on there. I knew a few of the pain points that everybody had, a few of the touch points that everybody had. I'll put this down. And it's hard to recognize, but this green is different than that green guy. So I'll put this one, and I think here was another one. The things I knew about thoughts and feelings already. And now the actual work starts. What you see here, the pale pink and the pale green is already the first and the second interview I've gone through. And now you see the process. Interview by interview, I'll go, stop the recording, write it, stop the recording, rewind, write again. I'll pick up the relevant information. And you see, every interviewer has their color here. Yeah, in spite of the few post-its I had at the beginning, every interviewer has, interviewee has their color. Thousand over thousand hundred post-its, guys, from these 10 interviews. You can't give that to any client and say like, here, there you go, figure it out. Doesn't work like that, yeah? So again, I sleep a night over. This is not one day work, what you see here, yeah? It's like four or five days work going through 10 interviews. Then I sleep another night over, very important. I can't emphasize it often enough. Sleep, guys. It's very good for your brain. And then I start consolidating all that information, yeah? Making it into some sort of a more compact, making sense, seamless story of what people go through. So we've got on top the actions. And you see, guys, I also put a little bit of weight there. Is it? One, two out of ten people said something, this will be the super pale, pale post-its, yeah? Or is it maybe seven or more people who said something? I know ten is not enough to quantify, yeah? But hey, if two people said something, or if seven or more said something, that kind of gives you a bit of weight as to what's the main use case we are looking at, and what are edge cases that kind of dock into that story. Then, guys, I will use that. I gathered the whole company. This was like a roughly 10 days process that I showed you the time lapse of. And then we'll schedule a four hour meeting with one hour, I think, lunch break. So call it, was it five hours? 9 30 to 15. Yeah, so like five hours with a lunch break, something like that. And I started at the beginning, I introduced to them the tool we are going to work with. It's called Miro, you know Miro probably, digital whiteboard, sanity keeper, yeah. Um, I introduced to them the tool we are going to work in super quickly so they feel comfortable in the, in the environment. And then guys, I use that profile and that experience map to put my customers into the shoes of Paul Fesser. Yeah, our persona was Paul Fesser, because yeah, professors, yeah, I'm very creative, I know. Um, so really to put them, to make them feel like Paul Fesser and what Paul is going through and where the struggles are and why does he dismiss the students' feedback? Why doesn't he even want to engage with our platform? I really use that the way you see me talk to you the same way I talk to customers. So I would cry out, be like, and now I come to work and all these youngsters have no idea and they want to tell me how to do my work. That were really that storytelling. We really make people kind of get into that story and really feel the pain, not just understand it, but really feel with Paul. And then guys, small break. Before that, sorry, we kind of uh, prioritized which areas do we want to concentrate in. And I think here you see we were kind of a bit more pain pointy, a bit more pain point heavy. And I think we all agreed kind of to get these areas roughly and try and do something here. So that was the voting that you see up here. And then we took a small break. Before that, we identified our challenges to what exactly do we want to solve for Paul now. We took a small break so our brains can kind of easen up a little bit. And then we got onto a quick ideation warm up and actual ideation, so solution mode already. 
And you see all the ideas we came up with, which is not all. Actually, here everything was full, guys. These are the ones that we kind of started presenting, clustering, building on each other, combining. You see here we started prioritizing. This is the rest of the idea. So we already had a parking, a backlog. Yeah, because one of the categories we took, we started looking at them in detail, kind of looking at the effort, impact, we, we estimate there, but all the rest we didn't want to lose. And actually we even parked a second challenge for another session like that to solve. Yeah? And then we started roughly, you see, like just with these ideas that were somewhere in here, we just started prioritizing this on a simple effort impact scale. Yeah, how much is it going to cost us to implement that? How much of an impact do we expect it to have? Low hanging fruits, bin, a trash bin, you know these metrics, yeah? However, we just started prioritizing, yeah? But two days later, I've already told them, guys, probably in the first session we are not going to be able to finish everything, so let's schedule a backup session for two days later while it's still fresh, not that fresh that I uh, trust the client, they'll remember exactly Paul Fesser, so I still take the first half an hour, one hour to really get them back into who do we need it to feel like so that we are in a position to solve their problems. So I again update them about who was Paul, what we agreed on solving for Paul. Then I remind them the ideas we actually picked and the ones that we saw most potential with. We continued, as you see the metrics from last time, we continued prioritizing them, picked our winners, and then the company I told you was four developers and one business developer. They sat down and started creating concept posters, so starting to develop the idea slowly. How does it work for us, for the business? How can we make it work? How does it work for the users? And now where is our inconfidence? What do we need to test to be sure that that thing is worth putting all our money and resources into? And you see, this is a little bit that prototype development. And then, guys, we actually made a roadmap. And if you see a roadmap with already a front-end element, yeah? So they were almost ready with the prototype while we were even talking about, OK, we'll need that screen. We'll need to see if that functionality will work better with tagging or whatever. And the guys on the background were already, Martina, is that what we mean? And they show us the UI. And it was like, amazing, put it in there. We are already done almost with the prototype. Now we can put it in front of these professors and see how they react. The second project I wanted to introduce to you guys is even, I find it even more interesting. Mm. It's about having something super new, like this invention stuff almost. So a client came to me in 2018 um, actually, end of 2017, beginning of 2018, um, and it was a smart home client. Do you guys remember back in 2017 when you heard smart home, what your association was? <gasps> Alexa, it's recording me! At least the majority, you not, I wouldn't expect it from you guys, but the majority of people on the street were like, smart home, this is spying, this is like something bad. And yet, most of the people were like, I know it's the future, but I would wait for my neighbor to get it and see if he survives, yeah? So, that client came to me and was like, we already worked two, three months with them, they knew me already, we worked on their getting their investors on board, so really understanding the mindset of the investors. And because we were quite successful for two, three months already working together, they were like, Martina, our business partner, who is the biggest electricity supplier in Berlin, wants us, sees an opportunity, opportunity, within elderly people. So our sales, sales people who go door to door, they're sure elderly people will buy us more if we were just to develop a remote control or an additional device for elderly people so that they can use our main device. Sounds legit, no? And I was like, wonderful, elderly people are out there on the street. Let's go out and talk to them and see what they think. And what do you guys think? This is the <laughs> analysis of 
we talked to six people. So we went out. We first found the grandma on the street. She, she was having time to drink coffee with us. We invited her to coffee. She actually brought us to her home to show us how she lives, which is incredibly valuable. But then in the afternoon, we went to a shopping mall where all the old people gather for their afternoon tea or coffee. Mm, yeah, a wonderful pool of research. And they were all like, let me also tell you about this one. And we were like, yeah, tell us all about it. And guess what, guys? Elderly people don't like stuff that you make for them and call it for elderly people. Surprise! It makes them feel old. So they actually not only don't like it, they hate it. They would really die out of passion to break your device that's only for elderly people. Because it makes them feel old. They don't like that. So we ask them hypothetically, would a device like a remote something smart home work for you? And they were like, not for me, for Helga, my neighbor. She's 81. And excuse me, how old are you? 86, but I'm not there yet. Helga is the one who needs that. I'm still managing by myself. So there was, as you guys can see, quite a huge resistance we had there. The red is again pain points. And also we started mapping the profile of Helga. And we're like, oh, they are going to smash us. No matter what we come up with, they're going to be like super angry because it makes them feel old. It makes them feel un empowered, like, what's the word, where they get their power taken away, their autonomy taken away, and that's the most important thing they have at that age, they actually fight for it, they don't want to move with the kids, they don't want to move in nursing home, because they can still make it, and that's really important for them, and we were kind of trying to take it away from them, not even realizing. So guys, we... However, the interesting stuff was that all these elderly people, guess what? They had a smartphone, they had an iPad, they had a Fitbit. Like three times more devices than I do. And I was like, okay, interesting. How do you guys get these devices? Does someone come on your door and try to sell that to you? And they were like, no, my son or my daughter's husband yeah, works in IT. And I was like, ooh. Wonderful information, thank you for that. Because, guys, guess what? Some of our existing clients were the grown-up kids of Helga. And also, we looked, so these were our existing clients. And then we looked for six non-clients who were, however, interested in smart home. So in the past six months, they've read something about, about smart home more than Alexa, or they've considered to buy some smart home device, yeah? So we recruited all these people, including our existing customers, and we're like, guys, how do you deal with your elderly parents who are not in a nursing home, who are not living next door to you? How do you make sure they're all right? And then we found out how they bring devices to them, and we were like, wonderful, our target. So instead of having the elderly people as our target group, we actually, as you saw, guys, we went back onto the understanding, we re-pivoted our research onto our existing clients, potential clients, they will bring our device to these guys without them smashing it in front of us with pleasure, yeah? So again, we talked to this about nine people, we did some additional desk research to see why Germany, why everybody knows that the future is smart home and yet you wait for the neighbor to see if it's safe or wait for the state to kind of impose it. Very interesting. So the popularity of smart home was, guys, something like 60, 70 percent. The convinced, people were convinced that it's the future 70, 80 percent. Adoption, 19 percent. It was like, okay, what's happening here? Why, why are people reacting like that? Then we went out, talked to the guys, you've already saw that method, it's the same one, we mapped interview by interview, gotten kind of that big picture of how do people think. Why is Alexa freaking them out? Why is smart home as a term freaking them out? Guess what, we started calling it home automation. Same thing, people weren't that freaked out, they were like, oh yeah, um, I can imagine my coffee machine starting before I get up. Now they were at ease and talking and not being recorded and not being spied on because the coffee machine doesn't know your preferences, yeah? And then, guys, what we did is gather all that information 
And this time I tried to do it. This was a company with 10, 12 developers. Everybody was a developer but me. And the one co-founder was a marketing executive, the one who I gotten on my hand and went out looking for elderly people to talk to. Um, and then I started actually with them, putting that in that mental model diagram that I mentioned to you before. So here, we don't look so much at the process, as in what stages people go through, but we look more at the mindsets. What happens in their head once faced with a new, design, with a new device? Yeah, what goes through their head? What is their expectation? And I started doing that with the, with the developers on board. It doesn't work, guys, I can warn you. So I took all that data away again in my dark room with a lot of smoke and analyzed for a week. Yeah? And then I came up with that map. If you guys want to know exactly how to go about it, I recommend the mental models. You'll find in the mapping experiences that I recommended before, you'll find a lot about the mental model, but the specialized book for that is the mental model by Indy Young. And guess what? The items here, there again we have pain points, uh, tasks. I think these were tasks and then thoughts and feelings. Don't pinpoint me on that. It's been four or five years ago. But these items, guys, you might have heard already of the jobs to be done framework. These are the jobs to be done. So if you want to know more about it, another book from Jim Colbeck, I'll highly recommend the jobs to be done playbook. Businesses, guys, if you talk to your manager and you say jobs to be done, they'll become this emoji with the heart eyes because they love jobs to be done as a concept. So I've taken that as a consolidation model, right? So mindsets rather than stages. And then, that's just a snippet of the entire map, guys. I started here at the beginning, it was a bit hard, so all of that I did away from the client, all that analysis. And now I went back a week later and was like, guys, let's all gather together again, because I've got something. I presented that to them, and as a next step, we started mapping their touch points. The touch points from the electricity supplier that we don't have much impact on. The one where we could have had the impact, so the light blue are the ones we... We had some touch point with the client, but we wanted to improve and really strengthen that touch point. The darker blue are the ones where we already had a good connection with the customers, with the clients, yeah? And the light gray was the ones that we wanted to create going on forward. And then, guys, we did an ideation session, pretty much the same as before. Yeah, solution mode. Now that we understood everything in detail, now that we know all the pains that people go through, how can we help them in that process? What can we do for them so it really works better? We came up with all these ideas you see on the bottom, all together now in the room, yeah? And then my project finished, I left the company, and guess what these guys have started doing? Pulling one by one, the ideas created a bit more space in between, yeah? And they started pulling one by one the ideas and actually mapping their app, which they already had. So these were the app screens. And then you guys will understand more than me. Some APIs and integrations and stuff I, like Chinese to me, yeah? But they started mapping their service solution. So they ended up expanding their service offering for existing and future customers rather than creating a new product. Um, and then, guys, I told you it's just a snippet of the map. So up to here, you see, we made ideation. This is what they've done by themselves. Continuing to improve the service for, I think it was the grown-up child of Helga. And Helga, guess what? So, oh, and then guys, two years ago, I was sorting my murals and I see there is this thing underneath and I was like, wait, the map was like up to here, what's happened? And I get in and guess what, guys? They've copied all the mindsets that we had already, that story that people go through, acquiring their product, unpacking it, customizing it, making it work for me, making it really safe. That safe that I would even give it to my elderly parents who I'm concerned for, yeah? They actually started mapping their marketing strategy based on these mindsets. 
So you see, they've already gone into, okay, how do we present ourselves to, to our customer? Again, based on that understanding of the mindset. And now imagine, guys, we wouldn't have done that. And we would have done what the business wanted for, uh, from us. Make a new device for elderly people. I think that would have ended like very interesting because I tell you, these guys were so passionate to tell you how they smashed uh, from Red Cross, they've gotten that um, uh, bracelet and they've thrown it in the toilet and they were so happy that they got rid of the thing. Imagine we would have put the money because, hey, let's face it, Fattenfau has money. They would have given us quarter million to go and produce that thing, yeah? So that we can watch how people smash it with pleasure. So guys, I hope I am not too fast or not too slow, but we are coming slowly to an end. It's kind of the takeaway from my talk. I hope I was able to inspire you for the next two days, your exciting time here with talks, to also consider the human factor, because that thing can really kind of screw up your process, yeah? You can have a wonderful idea, everything could be wonderful in your head, and then people just hate it. Even though they told you they'll buy it, they just hate it. So put in a bit of effort, guys, before wasting all this money, all these resources, your nerves. Come on, every one of us knows how it is to work on something and then your manager says, oh, it gets this scope, sorry. Yeah. So let's instead of kind of like wild going and solving things, let's try and learn before we waste all our efforts because a general rule of thumb that we like to use in UX to convince our managers is, listen, every dollar that you invested in getting to know the people you're solving something for saves you $10 in visual design or developer uh, development and $100 in post-production maintenance. Yeah, so it's literally saving money when you just get to know the people you're doing it for a bit better. And that's it from me, guys. I can't believe I made it. <laughs>